thank you all for being here. Um, the goal of this morning is to do safe sanctuary training, uh, but to do it in a way that is um, helpful, informative, and uh, quick. Um, so please feel free to stop me at any point as we're going through this presentation and ask questions that you have. Uh, but if you don't have questions, then I'm just going to keep moving um, through, the, through the process. So feel free to, if I'm not seeing your hand, feel free to just jump in and interrupt me. We are going to start, uh, Michelle, if you want to advance to the next slide. Um, we start with the why. Um, obviously, you know, being on staff at a church, we recognize that um, we are, our, one of our goals is to um, care for our children. One of our goals is to love our children. And we do that, um, first and foremost, because Jesus, uh, because God loves our kids. Um, this is, is seen throughout scripture, you know, like God has a very deep um, value for um, children. And so it is a part of our responsibility as well to um, to make sure that we provide a safe space for them, to love them and care for them, um, and, and ultimately raise them up as young Christians. Um, we love kids as well. Uh, whether or not you are just on staff or if you work more closely directly with students, uh, we have a love for children here um, at the church. And so we, again, we just commit and covenant together to um, care for them in a responsible and appropriate way. And we want to be proactive um, in protecting all of our kids and all of our uh, vulnerable adults and uh, volunteers who work with um, children, youth, or vulnerable adults. We want to make sure that we are trained, we know what's going on in advance, so that we are ready um, should some sort of incident arise. We know how to respond, we know how to react, and we're not uh, backpedaling, we're not worried, uh, sort of about what do we do? We know what to do because we've been trained. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, what we are going to go through today, um, we, I, we have, what you have in front of you is a portion of our safe sanctuary policy along with a few forms um, that you should be familiar with. Um, and so, the first thing we are going to cover is uh, what specifically is covered by safe sanctuary. Not everything that happens in the church is automatically covered uh, by our safe sanctuary policy just by virtue of who's participating. Uh, but then even there are certain events that we do at Church of the Savior that sort of are a gray area. Um, drive through Nativity being the biggest one. Um, that there are a lot of kids involved, there are a lot of parents and adults involved, um, and so what do we do with that? We're going to talk about yeah, some of the different activities and what is covered under safe sanctuary policy. We are also going to talk about our screening process. What does it look like to invite somebody into a volunteering position or onto staff, um, as we all have been, um, to work with our children, the youth or vulnerable adults. We are going to talk about the specifics of supervision. So what are you experiencing? What should you keep in mind as you are actively working with students? If you've got a classroom of second graders for Sunday school, what are the things that you need to know you need to be aware of? And then lastly, we are going to talk about reporting and responding to an incident. If something should happen uh, while there is a student in your care, or if something should be um, brought to you and, and um, told to you or alleged to you, uh, sort of how do we respond to that? How do we react in those situations? So we will begin uh, by looking at our Statement of Covenant down at the bottom of page three in your packets. Um, and I'm not going to read this for you because I trust that you all know how to read it, but this is our official covenant statement. This is what we, as staff, as volunteers who work with um, children, youth, and vulnerable adults, agree to. So I'm going to shut up and let you read that for just a moment. And so as you can see on the screen, we've highlighted a couple of um, sort of important you know, goals. Our, our three main areas are to provide reasonable safety measures, um, to educate, to make sure that the people are aware of what's going on, um, and then to have a clearly defined procedure for responding and reporting in the case of an incident. So if there are no questions, we will continue to move forward. Um, specific activities covered by this policy. So, on pages, the pages that you are fl flipping by on pages four or five and six, those are our definitions. Uh, we should say definitions and terms. And that is just for you to be familiar with. What does it actually mean when we say a child or children? What does it mean when we say an adult leader? Uh, those sorts of things. So I encourage you to look through that as well um, if you, we get to a point and you have questions about what do we mean by this specific term. But in terms of activities specifically covered by this policy, um, there are sort of, yeah, there are two categories, if you will, in terms of 
what is covered by this policy, and then there are activities and events that are not covered by this policy. So in terms of what is specifically covered, um, this would be anything that directly falls under children's youth, children's choir, youth choir, um, something that is specifically provided, programmed for anybody under the age of 18 or a vulnerable adult. And so that means Sunday schools, um, youth activities, youth groups, um, when we go to stand volleyball, our summer mission trips, um, VBS, all of these things that you would typically think, oh yeah, those are children's activities, those are youth activities, all of that is covered under this. Montgomery Nursery School, as you can see on your page, is covered under our safe sanctuary policy, but as we were talking about just a moment ago, they have a, a more strict policy that they follow. So by doing their own training, by following their own standards, they automatically adhere to all of our safe sanctuary policy uh, for churches of this nature. And then, so the, the activities that are not covered, uh, the, the second section there on page seven, um, that is what I spoke to a moment ago. Um, these church-wide, these sort of family activities that we will do every once in a while, not all the time, um, but where the, the focus is on um, having the whole family present. Um, for an activity like drive through nativity, or if you remember our chili cook-off that we did a few years ago, or some of these bigger church-wide activities, the assumption is that parents are attending with their children, and so they are responsible for caring for their kids. Um, now again, if this, is, if this were to be a VBS type event, uh, we would recognize that the volunteers are going to be more directly responsible for the kids than their parents would be, even if you know, somebody like David Anderson may be on-site volunteering, but there are other people who are directly responsible for his children versus the, the cook-off the chili cook-off, where it would be expected that families would travel together, move together, be together. Now, just because an activity or an event is not directly covered by our safe sanctuary policy does not mean we all get to just check out and say, all right, I don't have to worry about anything. Um, the goal of educating, the goal of our safe sanctuary policy is that as many people as possible would have eyes, a, a lens to look through and recognize, ooh, that doesn't look safe, or hey, there's a kid wandering off by himself and that doesn't seem like it's a good idea, we should come alongside them, help them you know, figure out where they're going or find out why they're lost, that sort of thing. Um, so even though these activities are not directly covered by the safe sanctuary policy, we still ask that everybody be diligent, be responsible, and paying attention to those sorts of things. The other major um, grouping of activities that is not covered under our safe sanctuary policy are non-church groups that use our facilities. Boy Scouts would, be, would fall under this category. And again, they have, Boy Scouts would not fall under this category. What does that mean? Boy Scouts are sponsored by the church. Okay. So they would fall into the first category just like the coming nurseries. Okay. They have a more rigorous policy than we do. Yes. So but have they gone through our safe sanctuary training? Nope. Then why would they, I mean? Ultimately, they have the same same thing as nursery school. They have the same, and that's ultimately what I was going to say, right. regardless of where they are. They have their own set of policies right. that they are, and we review those right, right. in our partnership with them. Um, as their chartering agent, I have to qualify under their policy okay. for the church. Okay, gotcha. Um, and that's the major, major one. I can never think of another grouping that uses the space in a regular sort of way that would qualify. The orchestra, right, is an outside group, but they don't have members under the age of 18, so they don't A visiting it. church youth group. Staying in the that building. would be, yeah, that would be probably a good um, a good example. And in a case like that, again, we would, we would ask to see their policy uh, before they would, you know, come in and use our space to make sure they are following some sort of um, guidelines. If, if their policy is lesser than ours, would we ask them to review our policy and have their people adhere to it? Ultimately, there, what happens in those, um, there is an exchange of policies that it's asked that I'll look at their policy, they'll look at our policy, um, and then there's a conversation that happens. I have yet to have a conversation where policies don't match up pretty well. Um, but in that event, I think there would just need to be some conversation. If there was something you know severely lacking around supervision or something, we would um, you know, just yeah, make sure that they were aware of that. Normally with a church group, they're going to be covered by, like Jake said, a very similar policy where we run into questions before and they have it stay here in seven or eight years is non-church affiliated groups. There used to be a summer um, program that Pastor Doug was involved in that they brought a group down and they spent a couple of days in the building. 
they would be a, an area where we would have to do a little more investigation because they don't think the way we do about these kind of things. They have their own way of thinking about it, but we'd have to go do a little more evaluation, right? Okay. Any other questions on this before we keep going? All right. Michelle, if you would. Uh, great. So this, we are looking at pages eight um, and a little bit of nine as well. <coughs> Um, so this is the process by which we invite somebody into the volunteering um, process here at Trooper Savior. Uh, so we start with uh, just looking, are they an active member in the congregation? Maybe. Are there things on here, Michelle? There we go. Okay. Uh, so we, we um, look for volunteers. Um, safe sanctuary policies will vary in range. Ours is not um, clearly defined as far as I know, but typically somewhere between three and six months, we ask that a person be volunteer or be just here present in the church uh, before we consider them for a youth or children's ministry volunteering position. Um, and part of that is just a, a in, informal vetting process. We want to make sure other people get a chance to know this person. Um, I want to be able to go and say, hey, Pastor Jen, have you met Bob? And she says, oh, yeah, we've seen Bobby. Bob, you know, he worships at the 820 service, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and we have sort of a, a record of this person. We know who this person is. Um, if somebody were to show up you know, first Sunday and say, hey, I'm ready to volunteer with the youth, we would say, hey, that's great. I'm glad that you're excited, uh, but let's you know, give it some time. Let's make sure we get an opportunity to get to know that person um, just within the context of our community. Next, um, we also look to, um, there, we've got a screening application, uh, which I left over here. You don't have this in front of you, but uh, we have a form that we ask. Maybe I don't have. There's a form, ultimately, that we ask people to fill out um, that is a volunteer application. Um, this is something that we keep on file. Um, and in addition to that, there's also a background check form that we ask everybody to go through the background check, which I think is the next, boom, background check. Um, and this is, um, again, just all, all of this is um, covering our bases, make sure that we know who this person is on paper so that when somebody comes to us and says, hey, do you know Dave Anderson? We can say, yes, we've got his file, we've got his background check. You know, we're all good to go. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so is there another thing on this one? Nope. All right. I so, Jake, I have a question. Yes. Um, with the background checks, is that a one and done thing? If somebody has a background check in 2020, mm -hmm. are they good forever? Or is there some point down the road where? Yes, we do have a re-screening process. Do we keep them for three years? Okay, so we yeah, so we ask everybody to read. We need to have a huge number go back through the process. Yes. So yes, Margaret. Who does the background checks? So Dave, oversees that today. process. I'm working on a process that will change that. And giving who that who that authority? What? You're working on a process to change that to change it to what? where other individuals can request them using Realm. Okay, because that's, yeah, in Realm, they have, we have that ability. So then Correct. Jake and Michelle could do that Correct. process and track that. But it, it will be a fixed body of group of people that does them. Well, right. Our and I still have staff. to be involved because of the printing and the filing and all okay. of that stuff that goes along. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes, so great question. <coughs> yes. Well, and in the meantime, um, there is a field on every person's record that is available to put background check information in terms of whether it's been ordered, what, if it's pending, if it's come back approved, whatever. It, it, it doesn't have details about the background check itself, but just the fact that it's been ordered, whether it was ordered through Rome or not. Um, it's in, part of the new process. In recent months, as we have received a bill to pay for the background checks. I've been going into Realm and putting on the person's record, background check was ordered, whatever date, and it's in there as pending. Um, so that's something that could become a project to retroactively go back and, and indicate that background checks were ordered for people just to get all that on their record. But that's not something that we, were, we had previously kept on the database. Um, so just so you're aware, there are probably four people in Rome right now that have that marking. <laughs> um, so I'll just leave that. It, it's out there. There are a few people that are marked pending and nothing else has happened with it. But it's something that until we get to where 
Because I believe if you order it through Realm, Realm will automatically do all the, those yeah. steps. In the meantime, if you want to use that field, it's out there and you can do manual entry to it. Great. Thank you. And I don't, this, if this is listed somewhere else, but the fact that rescreening for volunteers is every three years is not on this page. Correct. Is it, it somewhere else? Yes, it's elsewhere. Okay. Good. Any other questions about screening? All right. We move into supervision. Uh, so again, this is this. These are the things that you need to be aware of. You need to be considering um, as you are actively volunteering with children, youth, or vulnerable adults. The first one you're doing right now: training. Way to go. Um, so our policy asks that every volunteer be trained in person once every three years. But we also, as you see, there's an annual training requirement. So on the two years in between the in-person training, we have online uh, recertification tests that you can take. And as long as you pass them, um, then you are recertified during the, the, that's something that we keep track of, Michelle and I, and we will alert you. So in a year, in August, you guys will get an email from me with the Safe Sanctuary policy and a link to one of our forms um, that you can go in and, and take your test. And then as long as you pass, you are recertified and you're good for the next year. Um, but we do, yeah, we do ask that everybody be trained annually. And again, that's in an effort to educate um, as many people within our congregation as possible. The next rule is the two adult rule. Um, and this is really, this is one of the biggest pieces of our safe sanctuary policy, uh, but it also has a number of caveats that we sort of have to, yeah, just make sure that we understand. So the goal in every classroom and every youth activity um, is that there should be two unrelated adults supervising those activities. Um, now, there are, again, some exceptions. Um, if the, if there is, let's say it's a Sunday morning, and not during the pandemic, but let's say there's a Sunday morning, so we've got multiple Sunday school classrooms going, or a Wednesday evening when we've got choir, multiple classrooms, multiple activities. There, we, during those times, we can designate what is known as a roamer. Uh, this is somebody who is intentionally in the hallways, moving from classroom to classroom, just aware that these classrooms, you know, let's say 105 and 106, they've got two, you know, two uh, leaders, they're good to go. 112, there's only one adult, um, so I need to make sure that I am aware of that um, and, and just present in that area. Traditionally, Michelle and I serve as those roamers. Um, Pastor Vicki and Margaret also jump in every once in a while, but that we, we primarily um, cover that just because it's sort of an ambiguous role that is hard to schedule a volunteer into. Not impossible, uh, but so far that has sort of been the practice. Um, the there, so uh, within the two adult rule as well, um, if we've got a couple, let's say Lindsay and I are leading a youth activity, um, best practice says that we should also have a third adult present, somebody who is not related to us, um, or yeah, even you know, if Tammy and Emma, yeah, and we're volunteering and doing something, there ideally there would be a third adult present who is not related um, to them that would be would act as sort of that that third party, if you will. Um, and then, yeah, for any overnight activities where there are, are um, when it's a co-ed activity, there must be unrelated male and female adults present for those activities. If we're doing a lock-in, if we're going away on a mission trip or something, we've got to make sure that we have both male and female leaders. Any questions about two adults before we move on that one? Sort of a big one again, I just want to make sure we all understand. Yes, Michelle? Um, is there also a, an adult with a youth? Yes, okay. yes. So. Um, we will get into this a little bit later on in terms of our supervision, but there is, oh, actually, just kidding, it's right here. Mm -hmm. um, so the four-year rule, what the four-year rule says is that you must be at least four years older than any of the participants that you are supervising. Um, so in Michelle's world, there are uh, many opportunities for youth who are not yet 18 to still volunteer um, and be a part of uh, leading Sunday school, leading children's choirs, different things like that. What that looks like on paper um, is there we can't ever have two youth, two people who are under the age of 18 leading uh, an activity. They can't qualify as two adult leaders. But we do have one Sunday school class that is led by Katie Bach and Katie Mott. Katie Mott is a parent. Katie Mott is a, I believe she's 16. Um, she's a junior in high school. And with Katie Bach's presence as the leader, Katie Mott as a 16-year-old qualifies as the second leader. Uh, because she's four years older than the students that she is participating with or she is overseeing 
Um, and because the, of the presence of a second adult, she then qualifies as a leader um, in that situation. That mostly, that, yeah, that pretty much only happens in um, children's ministry because in youth ministry, um, at that point, four years older, it gets you to above 18. And, and then, you know, realistically, if you're working with seniors, you've got to be at least 22 um, to be qualified as a full-fledged adult. Again, there are spaces um, where if, you know, with, if, within junior high, if we've got an 18-year-old or a 19-year-old who is out of high school um, and, and um, meets the requirements for being an adult leader, they can be a second, but they wouldn't qualify necessarily as the first. Jake, I have a question drawing on history. Yes. Um, for example, last year at Vacation Bible School, um, I ended up getting called into a group because one of the children needed some one-on-one -on -one attention, not so much because of the leaders, uh, but it was a group of four-year-old, three, four-year-olds who had two teens, yes. under 18 teens as their leaders. Yes. Was that okay because the way VBS was structured, those two girls were never with their group without other adults in the room because we went to stations and each station had an adult leader and that kind of thing? That's my understanding, if, and I, I won't be able to speak to that terribly clearly, uh, but my understanding was there were clusters, yeah. that, that the individual smaller groups operated in clusters, and there was always an adult attached to each of yep. those clusters. They were never alone. Right. Right. But there, that, like that particular group, until I came in to be the aide for the one student, they would usher them around on their own, but they never ended up in a room by themselves where they were just in charge of the right. kids with it. Right. And that was, exactly. so that, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, for, for bigger events, especially our summer activities, Vacation Bible School and Mission Trip Choir Tour, um, there are, when you look at the structure of the policy, there are certain places where we build in, yeah, the, the oversight, even if it seems like, yeah, there are, it, you know, right now we've got two teenagers who are overseeing this small group of students, but within the larger structure, there are supervision, you know, we're meeting all of those requirements, so. But yeah, good question. Any others? Yes, Margaret. And also, like what Andy said, sometimes I would be called in to comfort a child. I always did it someplace visible. I didn't like take that child into a, a closed room because it needed quiet, which would have been nice. I always tried to find a quiet corner visibly in front of everybody. Yeah, and that's going to be, I don't know if that's the next yeah, four that's point or in a couple. That's coming up? Okay. Yeah. And if you want to do the next one too, Michelle, those, yeah, those cut there together. Um, so, yes, exactly what Margaret was speaking to. Um, we, when we are supervising, we should never leave a child alone. Um, so if you're, you know, if, if, if Nolan Anderson is just being a real pain and they're like, you know what, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the playground, but we're just going to leave Nolan in the classroom. Can't do that. Nolan's got to be able to come to the playground. <laughs> um, um, yes, ultimately, you know, we should never, if, and that's, in this, We'll talk, talk about this in a little while, but this is why attendance is so important uh, because you, as the leaders, you need to know who, what, who is in your group, who you're responsible for, uh, so that if you do move from a classroom to the playground, if you're going, if you, know, if you travel anywhere, or even if you're just letting people go to the bathroom or anything like that, you need to know who you're supposed to be responsible for um, so that you're never allowing people to be alone. Now, inevitably, what comes up with this question is around bathrooms um, with children, and I don't know. Um, I'm going to defer that one over to Michelle in terms of um, allowing kids to go to the bathroom um, and, and that sort of thing. We let them go to the bathroom. Yes, yes. I mean, we, we do that. So how do we They have to go too often. It should be scratched. <laughs> you get so many. One bathrooms. time for you. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. So. Um, so in the preschool room, they have a restroom. So they are able to go a Leave the, we'd leave the door cracked so that the teacher has access. Um, older kids usually would have them go in pairs and with an adult, again, that's escorting them and waiting. I mean, they have stall doors, so waiting at the door or somewhere so that they're, they're uh, being supervised. But in that case, it's kind of like the rule of three, right? right? So it's either two adults and a child or two children and an adult. Um, but unless you have parent permission that says um, you're allowed, like I have a 
second grader that still isn't good at wiping and they're going to need assistance, you need to have that in writing that it's okay for the volunteer to um, do that. Yeah. And in the youth world, we just say, sorry, that's <laughs> their own problem at that point. Um, but yes, ultimately, you know, again, the goal is um, the goal is. Um, yeah, as, as Michelle mentioned, a, a good rule of three, uh, making sure that you are never one-on-one -on -one, um, with somebody, unless, you know, there are certain times when, um, in, in yeah, youth ministry and in children's ministry, when somebody may need um, individual consultation, um, just some time to, to sit and to be heard and that sort of thing. Um, and in those scenarios, um, that's when, just what Margaret was saying, you know, making sure that you find a place that is open, um, a place that is in view of other uh, people, um, our church is is almost completely designed that way. Almost all of our doors have um, a window in them, so that they're even when a door is shut, um, you can still see into the room. Um, the exception would be the music room, and then the youth room. Music room, I'm sure, can't have windows. Um, no, it's got a window on the single door. Oh, does it? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, the youth room is the only one. So when you shut these double doors, um, you can't see into the room. Obviously, we've got all these windows, but uh, but the requirement if you ever use the youth room with children or youth is that one of the doors needs to stay open, um, and that just yeah maintains that open view line of sight rule. Um, along with this, um, and this is more if again more in the youth ministry world, but not exclusively. Um, if you ever are asked to meet with a student one on one, if you are working through a project or something, uh, meeting in public meets these requirements. You are in view of other people. If you go to a coffee shop, if you are um, you know, outside in, in view of other people, um, you, you qualify in this way. Um, just as Margaret was saying, sometimes there are conversations that should be had one-on-one. -on -one, um, and so we, we recognize that. We want to accommodate for that. But we've got to make sure that we do that in a smart way, in a safe way. Um, and again, you know, as much as, as it's possible, if you can get parent permission to be meeting with that child one-on-one, -on -one, that is um, ideal. So that goes through those two, and then attendance. Um, we do ask that all um, scheduled activities that we keep attendance, we log attendance on Realm. Um, and with attendance, yeah, make sure that you have um, the list there at the bottom of uh, 10, um, the name, the date of the function, the location, um, and then um, with, within attendance as well, make sure you are marking yourself. You as the volunteer um, are present and active in that scenario. Uh, right now, obviously, we've been, I think, hyper-vigilant in that, uh, just because of contact tracing and everything. But even, even you know, let's say we wake up in a, in a month and COVID is gone, uh, we still need to know that everybody's here. Um, and, and in a real sense, uh, this provides an alibi for you. Um, if somebody says, hey, you know, Pastor Vicki was saying really inappropriate things on Wednesday night activities, and we can go back and say, well, according to attendance, she wasn't even here in the building. Um, and so, there, you know, this, this protects you as volunteers as much as it protects any of our kids. Um, so please, please, please make sure you take attendance. Uh, you get attendance into the proper place, and if it needs to go to Michelle or myself, or if it needs to be logged into Realm, uh, that you do that in a timely manner so that we've got accurate records um, moving forward. What's next? Overnight off-site rules and activities. Um, so this uh, does not apply to everybody. Obviously, there is a small group of people who travel off-site um, who do overnight activities. Um, but it's good. We do have some notes in here uh, just in terms of what needs to be considered. Um, and, um, and that sort of yeah, touches on drivers as well, um, recognizing that we have a required number of drivers and, and a, a ratio list in terms of how many drivers we are supposed to be involved in each vehicle and that sort of thing. Um, you can see those on yeah, pages 10 and 11. Um, ultimately, when it comes to drivers, um, if there is one vehicle that is going from, like, let's say we're taking four kids from the church over to Grand Sands in Loveland, um, there should be two adults driving in that car, two unrelated adults. Um, if there are four cars that are all going over to Loveland, um, if there, as long as there is one adult driver in each vehicle, they are caravanning together, um, and they, there is not the requirement for two adults to be in each vehicle, so long as there are at least two students in each vehicle. Um, that goes back to what Michelle mentioned, the rule of three. There should never be just an adult and just a student driving in a vehicle. Um, there is a, we do have a mission trip waiver exception form. Um, if Dave needs to take somebody to the airport or pick somebody up from the airport, um, we are allowed to request written parent permission for that to happen. Um, and it's not just Dave. Other people have done that in the past, but that's his favorite thing, so. <laughs> um, hey, um, Dave, on, Dave, uh, not Dave. Dave, on mission trips, um, when there's a truck 
or some other vehicle that only has two seats in it yes are students ever allowed to be the other seat, the passenger in that vehicle or is that always to be just two adults no that the penske should always be two adults okay. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity how many of your youth leaders are under 25. this year looking at the fall i've got um i'm going to say two i think who okay. are going to be hopefully helping out pretty regularly and who are not yet and i'm not yet okay just because i Yeah, and that was something we are we've been having. So you see there at the top of page eleven, it says all drivers must be at least twenty five years of age. Uh, that's the way our policy reads currently, and so that's the policy that we follow. Um, in tracing that out, I realized that came from the fact that rental companies ask their drivers to be twenty five. There's right. not necessarily an insurance requirement, right. and so I'm I'm hoping to have some conversation around adjusting that age to allow for greater access. Um, but I'll be yeah, recognizing that we. We yeah, need to make sure we're following insurance, we're, we're making wise decisions, um, and those sorts of things. But yes, currently the way it reads, 25 years and older are people who are supposed to be driving, um, with the exception of there can be, um, we can get written or written approval from servant leadership board if they're in, in the event that we were to ask a 22-year-old you know, to drive or something to that effect. Any other questions here before we, oh yes, next one. Um, come early and stay late. We do ask that um, inevitably there's always a student who gets dropped off 15 minutes early. Inevitably there's always a student who is there 10 minutes late. Um, and so we do ask that volunteers also commit to um, staying for the supervision of um, kids. Now with drop off, with pick up, we do try to do our best to encourage um, to train parents to be present, to be on time. Um, but if Sally is waiting at the end of the night, we can't just leave Sally. Uh, we've got to make sure that she has adults who are supervising her and making sure that, that until mom or dad comes and picks her up or guardian or whoever. Um, this isn't a big problem with our activities, but with other activities that happen in the building, we have a lot of trouble with kids showing up 45 minutes early for an event and there being no adult supervision in the right. building. Um, this is regularly a issue I have to work with the scouts and occasionally we'll see it with youth showing up. Mom's on their way somewhere and they're gonna drop them off. They'll be fine at the church till the event starts, but they're the only person in the building right. with staff doing other things, sometimes just a single staff person in the building, but there's kids in the building extended periods of time before other people show up. Yeah. So the better we can coach parents and kids don't get here before at the earliest 15 minutes before the show starts, right? Yes, and that's something that if when that happens I have a conversation with mom or dad and just say, Hey, I appreciate that, you know, that sometimes driving schedules don't always work out. Please let me know if we need to coordinate rides, uh, those sorts of things. And yeah. Um I had seen it happen to me the other day and afterwards I thought, I wonder if that was the right thing to do. Sure. Um Sophie, who was painting for you, yeah. was here and Nermeen was not here and she was waiting outside and as I was walking in, she's like, Can you let me in the building? Nermeen's not here yet. And I was like, Sure. So I let her in and then I was like, Oh, was I supposed to do that? Yeah. Like, so like that's, I mean, she was by, I think I'm assuming by herself in here, but like, what's the, how do you handle a situation like that? Yeah, so so with something like that, unfortunately, um, would you say, yeah, so if you're, yeah, if you're able to wait on the bench, that would be, you know, if she's, if she's about to wet herself, she, you know, something, yeah, obviously she, we, we can be gracious. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to leave her out there, but. Is that the safer option for Sophie, though? I mean, out where, well, anyway, I'm just thinking predators lurking there versus, I mean, predators. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just was like afterwards. I was like, oh, I wonder if that was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't sure. So. Yeah, and that was, I mean, that was a, a somewhat unique incident mm -hmm. uh, where people were showing up for not exactly a scheduled sure. activity. Um, yeah. So the answer is no, don't let her in. If, no. Yes, uh, we would ask that you. Uh, it's not a hot day. <laughs> yeah. I, so then she's secondly unsupervised in the building. Yes, because then she, yeah, because ultimately then she's unsupervised within our, in, you know, the property. And, and My bad. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, it, these are, yeah, they're safe sanctuary butts up against some of those awkward -er locations. Hey, Jake, is there a situation where uh, she could have let them in and took them to the conference room and had a couple adults present in that space? 
and then award the, the remaining back pay. She's in the conference room. Um, if if there were other adults present, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think Chuck was already in the. Um, yeah, I think if there's another, if there's two cars out in the parking lot. Sophie's parents dropped her off knowing she was unsupervised. It's on that parent that they left their child without knowing there was an adult here yet. Because clearly they pulled in, there was no cars in the parking lot. So that's why it's, yeah. that's why he's saying that. Right. But yes, if Sam pulled in and there's three, four, right. five, and you were in building, here. yeah, come on in. There's a lot of adults in here. Yeah. We know that there's supervision. And that's one of the reasons we train That's why staff, we're all trained. So that we all are, yeah. we all meet that requirement. Yeah. See, where it gets it tricky doesn't. is they'll come in here and sit, mm -hmm. and we're in our offices. I get that. Yeah, there, there is, okay. right. again, it, it's that balance of being gracious and providing the supervision that we say we're going to provide. Right. Right. So, and again, with the building secure, I love it. Right, no, absolutely. I, I, I just, would, like I, I said. I prefer to have them in the building con right. contained than sitting outside on that that seems like this the yeah. worst place in the world so the park and again it, some of it depends on do i know the kid who right. is the kid some some other history there but, yeah. yeah good the last little point here substance abuse please 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 do not show up to a children's or youth activity if you've had a beer if you've been out and had a glass of wine if you are more than just one glass in, obviously. Um, <laughs> and this one, you hope that, you know, I, yeah, Margaret's, you know, sipping through her mask over there. And, <laughs> Do these meetings count? These, yeah, we, even the training. Yeah, asking so, for a friend. Yeah. Jim and <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to take a sniff of everybody's uh, glass on our way out. Um, but ultimately, you know, you hope that this never, you, nobody ever has to think about that. But the reality is when we do youth activities on a Sunday evening, if there's a one o'clock Bengals game, hey, I went to the game, oh, I had a beer, you know, with my hot dog or whatever, uh, we do ask in those situations, let us know, alert us, of the, hey, you know, this this happened, um, I wasn't thinking about it, or I was thinking about it, I just decided, you know, I'm not gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, you know, we- um, Another issue though that really can happen is if you've had a medical procedure, or if right, you've been yeah. given a, a, just like a painkiller or something from a medical procedure, you don't right. realize the results. I've had that happen before where adult was, not fully with it when they were trying to do what you think. And they just didn't want to acknowledge it because right. it was, they thought they'd be fine. Yep. It just happens. Yep. Absolutely. And so, yeah, we recognize these things. Uh, please let us know. Please don't come. Uh, yeah. Don't feel yeah, guilty like, oh, I'm letting everybody down. Uh, let us know. And this, this, again, this protects you as much as it protects us. We would hate for you to come in and, and hey, Joe smelled kind of funny, or Joe was acting really weird, and <laughs> this, this helps to protect your <laughs> reputation as much as yeah, well, <laughs> especially weird. <laughs> um, so yeah, so ultimately, and again, you know, if this becomes a habit, if it's, you know, three Sundays out of the month, Nick's not coming to youth group because he's just been having a good afternoon, then maybe there's another conversation that needs to be had. But ultimately, um, we do, yeah, we do ask that, um, Whatever it is, whatever you know, whatever the circumstances, please, 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 um, do not come if you are under the influence, and, and let us know. Um, and that goes for you, smokers in the room, to everybody who you know, smoking the, the cigars, just leave them at home, um, <laughs> because ultimately, yes. Um, so, any questions about this or, or anything else before we move on? I have, I have a question, but. I think maybe it needs to just be food for thought for a different discussion, not necessarily resolved here. But with the discussion about things like Sophie Lyon coming into pain, is there some sort of balance, especially for the, the teens that aren't 18 yet, but they're driving themselves, they're, you know, they're on the verge of adulthood, are we saying that you're not welcome to come into the building if you're not here for an activity or have an adult with you. Like if somebody is, for whatever reason, they're in the neighborhood doing something and they decide they want a quiet place to study or something and they want to go sit in the hallway at one of the high top tables and study. And like I said, I, I don't necessarily need an answer to this right now, but it's kind of food for thought where they 
an older child who is a little bit more responsible for himself anyway, are we saying you're not allowed in the building if you're if you're not here for something? Because yeah, we've got adults that will come in, and uh, we had somebody who used to catch the bus out here that would come in and sit and do email or whatever. And, yeah, I think it's kind of that hospitality versus safe sanctuary. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in a situation like that, again, because our staff is trained, um, if it were if it were me in the building by myself on a Saturday afternoon, I would say no to something like that because we don't have that coverage. Um, but outside of that, you know, if, if it's a Saturday, you know, if it's a Wednesday afternoon, somebody wants to show up early before fire, um, something like that, I think when we are covered, when we have two adults present uh, who can be aware that a student is in the building, um, then yeah, I, I would not have an issue with that um, as long as, again, as long as I was aware. Um, but it, yeah, it does. It is that fine line between walking the policy that we have in place and, and yeah, wanting to extend hospitality as well. So, um, so yeah, it, you know, that may be worth yeah, having a further conversation around. Um, and especially yeah, as we're living into this sort of pseudo, the building is locked but not always kind of thing. Um, it would be good to yeah, maybe have a little bit more clarification around that. Um, so good, good. Any other questions before our supervision before we move forward? All right, so this last section is um, around re reporting and response. Um, and, and within this, we have sort of two categories of responding. Um, one is what happens, how do you respond if a situation happens while you are immediately supervising a student? If you're in charge of Sophie Leong um, and she falls down, breaks her arm, what do we do in that scenario? Um, and so that's where we're gonna look first. Um, the first thing you do is uh, seek the appropriate medical attention. Um, if there is an active, um, you know, somebody is actively bleeding, uh, we encourage you to go to the first aid kit um, to, you know, get bandages, help them to, to solve the problem that is at hand. Um, if there is somebody who falls and there is a, a major head bleed, um, something that in your estimation would require an ambulance, uh, we, we encourage you to make that decision. Uh, we encourage you to not make it lightly, uh, but we encourage you that if an ambulance needs to be called, that you do that. Um, we do have a couple of uh, landline phones within the church, uh, but then we also recognize that most people have their cell phones, um, and so we, we encourage that. Um, and then sort of within that, if, if there were a perpetrator, if somebody were on site actively causing harm um, and we needed to call the police, um, again, we ask that you call the police, um, address the situation, and then um, you sort of move into the next steps, which are um, alert you know, the, the appropriate ministry director and, and you know, start to um, address the situation within um, the church as well. Uh, but initially, uh, we do ask that you address the situation at hand, um, that you, you respond medically as you're trained. If you're not first aid and, and CPR trained, we, you know, don't step in in a situation that you can't respond in. Um, but, but look for that um, and, and respond in those scenarios. Um, does that make sense? We have questions around that. Yep. Okay. Um, so Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so what happens after um, you have addressed the situation medically, you've addressed the situation and the police officer needs to be called? Uh, we have a incident, injury, and illness report form. It looks like this. Uh, it's got a bunch of tiny little check boxes on it um, and, and you know, little paper and that sort of thing. Um, and, and once the situation has been dealt with, let's say Sophie falls down, breaks her arm, um, we are able to get it set and her parents come and pick her up and take her to the hospital. Um, at that point, then you, as the a supervising adult would need to fill this out um, in you can do it on your own or you can do it in tandem with the ministry director so you can do this with Michelle you can do this with myself um, or if you're like you know what I've done this before I know what needs to go on this form um, you can fill that out um, and then we keep a record of this uh, we keep a confidential record of this on file um, and we alert the parents that hey something happened if a parent requests a one of these forms, um, they we can make a copy and give it to them. Uh, but the policy is not just to automatically give them the incident report. If that's something they want, they can request that, and we can give that to them. Um, where would where one where find that? that? Yes. So these we've got um, uh, clipboards um, in each of the classrooms um, that have a few of these reports 
Um, they've got a few of the second report that we're going to talk about, um, which is this. And then they also, on the front or somewhere very visible, they should have one of these flow charts. Um, and those should be in all of the, all the classrooms. Like I said, there's one in the youth room. Um, and in the event that you're, you, you, again, an incident has come up, you've responded appropriately, and you're like, I can't find one. That would be then reach out to Michelle, reach out to myself, and we can get one printed in and into your hands. Medical incident forms are in a clipboard of home health or first aid kit in the office. Okay, so then, yeah, there's also one in the office as well. So good, and then so you'll fill this out. Um, you will will get this you know filed away um, appropriately, um, and then beyond that, we ask that you uh, maintain a level of confidentiality. Um, at that point in the process, your role is you have done all the things that you are asked to do as the volunteer, as the supervisor, um, and so we um, yeah we just ask that you maintain confidentiality. Uh, these are things that you know even if it's a, something as simple as Sally fell down on the on the you know playground and. and skinned her elbow and she started to bleed and that sort of thing. We just ask that you don't, you know, you don't need to go home and tell your kids about it. You don't need to go home and tell your spouse about it. Uh, these are things that we, we keep confidential as best as we're able. Um, and for these ones, it you know, may seem a little bit less necessary, but we do ask that. And especially because of uh, the second form of reporting and responding that we do, uh, which comes around allegations of abuse. Um, so before we get to that, are there any questions around what do you do if something immediately happens in your school? Great. In that case, we'll move on to what happens if something is alleged to you. What happens when a student comes to you and says, hey, uh, there's a bad situation at school, there's a bad situation at home. Um, what is it that you need to do? Um, so in there, um, you will um, complete this second form that we've got, this um, uh, report of allegations of suspected abuse. Um, and so with that, um, you'll you'll go through that, and again, you can fill that out with the help of the ministry director, with the help of Michelle or myself, um, unless those allegations are brought against me. So if a student were to come to Joe and say, hey, Jake has done something that's not important, um, I would not obviously be the person that you would say, hey, can you help me fill this out, this uh, allegation of abuse? Um, that would, There is a, a chain of command um, that will sort of go around, and it will ultimately go to Pastor Jen, who's back in the room right now. Um, so we'll just give her all the paperwork, ultimately, is what I'm saying. Um, so yes, yeah, so this report um, gets filled out and filed with the appropriate ministry director. Um, and then again, we ask that you maintain a very strict level of confidentiality, um, that you um, treat everybody with respect um, and dignity, um, and that, um, yeah, ultimately, that you are not communicating outside of, of where you're supposed to communicate. If you receive, as a volunteer, um, this sort of allegation, um, that needs to go directly to the ministry director. And, and that, again, is sort of the end. Once you have helped to fill out the form, um, you have helped to make, um, make the ministry director aware. Um, and that they, the last step in sort of your process is that you, as the person who received the information, need to be present when Children's Services is called. Now I say it that way because you yourself do not have to call children's services. You can get help from myself, Pastor Jen, uh, Michelle, um, somebody who has done that, somebody who has, has oversees these sorts of things. Um, but and, and ultimately because those conversations can be fairly stressful. Uh, the first time you call children's services on your own, it's, it, you just, it's not a great feeling necessarily. Um, but we do ask that um, the, the, that phone call be made. Um, and. Um, and then, yeah, once that happens, um, that is that is your end. That we ask that you, you know, if if we have questions for you, if we need further clarification, we will reach back out to you. But we ask that you, at that point, you'd say, "All right, I've done my duty. I've done my due diligence," um, and and that is all. Um, and same thing. Copies of the report will be kept on file, um, and. That is, yeah, that's sort of the major response. If you look at the flow chart, this sort of outlines the various response plans. And again, these are posted um, in, the, in the clipboards um, around in the various rooms. So you, it's, it's an easier way to follow along. Um, and so again, you, you look at the top on the left. Um, number one, take all allegations seriously. Uh, provide appropriate care, which we've already talked about. Attend to the alleged perpetrator. Again, as we've already talked about, if you need to call 911. Um, Call 911. You'll see there in boxes two and three, emergency phone number or call 911. 911 is the phone to call you may. Um, there is no, there are other emergency phone numbers, but we ask that you call 911. 
Is there a clear copy that's available somewhere? This is what the conference has put out, so I'm no, sure the, we could make it. Because I can't read it. Oh, is it really? Oh, okay. I mean, gotcha. We can't read much of the words. Oh, okay. gotcha. So we just got bad copies. Yes, I will get you a better copy. Yes. Um, <laughs> that was just me. <laughs> gotcha. I know. That's why I was asking. I was not thinking. It's fine. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, ultimately, then, if you, yeah, just following along up here. Um, so we go through the first three, and then there's the level of notification. So you, as the volunteer, have received this information. Um, the first step is to um, you know, is to alert the person in charge of the ministry. So if it's a children's ministry activity, uh, making sure that Michelle is aware. If it's a youth ministry activity, making sure that I'm aware. Um, if this is something that needs immediate attention, if the director needs you know needs to be made aware, and we are not on site. Let's say it's a Wednesday evening, and I happen to be out of town. It's a Sunday morning, and somebody's out of town. Um, Michelle and myself and Pastor Jen and Pastor Vicki, we sub in for one another in that sense. Um, again, if the allegation is brought against one of us, um, that person should not be the one who is notified. But otherwise, if if you need me and, and Vicki is here, Vicki can count as me and say, you know, vice versa, I can count as Michelle, um, that sort of thing. Um, if the allegation is brought against me and I'm the only one here, um, that the person you reach out to and contact is the senior pastor. Um, and, and that's Jen, you've known Jen. Um, if, if an allegation were to be brought against the senior pastor, that would still come to either myself or Michelle, but then our next step, instead of alerting the senior pastor, would we would go to the servant leadership board chair, uh, which is Ben Feldmeyer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, great. Um, and then you can see um, here, and when you get the copy in front of you, um, there. this is just for your information for what happens next. Uh, you've done your due diligence, but this is the larger process into which you are playing so that you know, you've got peace of mind that, all right, then Jen will know, the district superintendent will know, the West Ohio Conference will have record, there will be other um, things that are happening. Um, once the notification is made, again, there, there needs to be the call to um, Children Protective Services, uh, which this, the number for that will be on the next slide, and um, the proper documentation has to be filed. Um, and then kept on file, and ultimately then at the end, um, yeah, we just ask for um, for care, for support. Um, if we have additional questions, if we need additional clarification, again, we'll reach out to you for that. Uh, but confidentiality in all of this, um, the senior pastor or the servant leadership board chair, which should be the only person speaking with the media in the event that something happens, if, if reporters show up and they've got questions, none of us do that. That's only for Jen or for Ben. Um, and yeah, and then on the last slide, we should have the appropriate phone numbers, I believe. That's the last slide. I think we're done. Well, there we go. <laughs> so yes, ultimately, uh, we just need to make sure um, you know how to get in touch with us, myself, Michelle. Oh, um, there, we Another one. <laughs> oh, there we go, here they are. Um, so in that, uh, Michelle, not even on here. I have a question regarding the reporting and so forth. Should this happen to be a student-to-student -student aggression, is the same reporting in place? Yes. Okay. Either whether yeah, whether you receive an allegation or um, or you witness it, if, okay. if siblings get into it, if the sheet siblings are chucking hammers at each other, it's still it's the same <laughs> again qualification. <laughs> This also applies too if for those that are involved in adult ministries, for if you uh, suspect elderly abuse, you can yeah. also use this article. This yeah. is really important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when we, and, and that, yeah, I didn't touch on that as much, but in terms of vulnerable adults, mm -hmm. um, that does mean, yes, yeah. adults who are elderly, um, any adults who have special needs, um, they all fall under that category of, of vulnerable adults. And so, um, yeah, we do have a lot of adult ministries that, that operate in that area in some capacity, and so knowing that and being aware of that is also important. And Jay, just to clarify your lead into this section of it, um, you mentioned something about if somebody comes to you and says something about uh, something that happened elsewhere. Yes. Or at home, school, whatever. So we're not limited to they've said something happened here or with somebody from church. It's they just come to you with any kind of Correct. activity that falls under this, please still follow this procedure. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, if, if regardless of uh, where it happens, if, if we receive allegations of abuse, that is something that we are required to act on. So, good question. Any other questions? 
Great. Well, thank you all so much for being a willing and participant audience. Um, if you have further questions, I'll be here for a little while. We're, I realize we're breaking up into other meetings as we finish this one. Uh, but again, thank you so much. And um, yeah, continue to keep our sanctuary safe. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Michelle. Great yes, everybody give it up for Michelle. Woo! What a great job. <laughs> for a role for you in uh, sanctuary.